the three stages of life, the question of how to define life is notoriously controversial. Competing definitions abound, some of which include highly specific requirements such as being composed of cells, which might disqualify both future intelligent machines and extraterrestrial civilizations. Since we don't want to limit our thinking about the future of life to the species we have encountered so far, let's instead define life very broadly, simply as a process that can retain its complexity and replicate. What's replicated isn't matter, made of atoms, but information made of bits, specifying how the atoms are arranged. When a bacterium makes a copy of its DNA, no new atoms are created, but a new set of atoms are arranged in the same pattern as the original, thereby copying the information. In other words, we can think of life as a self-replicating inform information processing system whose information or software determines both its behavior and the blueprints for its hardware. Like our universe itself, life gradually grew more complex and interesting, and as I'll now explain, I find it helpful to classify life forms into three levels of sophistications. Life 1.0, Life 2.0, and Life 3.0. I've summarized these three levels in Figure 1.1. It's still an open question how, when, and where life first appeared to our universe. But there is strong evidence that, the, that here on Earth life first appeared about 4 billion years ago. Before long, our planet was teeming with a diverse panoply of life forms. The most successful ones, which soon outcompeted the rest, were able to react to their environment in some way. Specifically, there were what computer scientists call intelligent agents, entities that collect information about their environment from sensors and then process this information into decide how to act back on their environment. This can include highly complex information processing, such as when you, when you use information from your eyes and ears to decide what to say in a conversation. But it can also involve hardware and software that's quite simple. For example, Many bacteria have a sensor measuring the sugar concentration in the liquid around them and can swim using propeller-shaped structures called flagella. The hardware linking the sensor to the flagella might implement the following simple but useful algorithm. If my sugar concentration sensor reports a lower level value than a couple of seconds ago, then reverse the rotation of my flagella so that I change direction. You have learned how to speak in you have learned how to speak in countless other skills. Bacteria, on the other hand, are in great learners. This their DNA specifies not only the design of their hardware, such as sugar sensors and flagella, but also the design of their software. They never learned to swim towards sugar instead, but algorithms was hard coded into their DNA from the start. There was, of course, a learning process of sorts, but it didn't take place during the lifetime of that particular bacterium. Rather, it occurred during the preceding evolution of that species of bacteria, through a slow trial and error process spanning many generations. Where natural selection favored those random DNA mutations that improved sugar consumption. Some of these mutations helped by improving the design of flagella and other hardware while other mutations improve the bacterial information processing system that implements the sugar finding algorithm in other software. Such bacteria are an example of what I'll call Life 1.0, life where both the hardware and software evolve rather than designed. You and I, on the other hand, are examples of Life 2.0, life whose hardware ev is evolved but, where who, but whose software is largely designed. By your software, I mean the algorithms and knowledge that you use to process the information from your senses and decide what to do. Everything from the ability to recognize your friends when you see them to your ability to walk, read, write, calculate, sing and tell jokes. You weren't able to perform any of those tasks when you were born, so all this software got programmed into your brain later through the process we call learning. Whereas your childhood curriculum is largely designed by your ability and teachers. So who decide what you should learn? You gradually gain more power to design your own software. 
Perhaps your school allows you to select a foreign language. Do you want to install a software module into your brain that enables you to speak French or one that enables you to speak Spanish? Do you want to learn to play tennis or chess? Do you want to study to become a chef, a lawyer or a pharmacist? Do you want to learn more about artificial intelligence or AI in the future of life by reading a book about it? This ability of Life 2.0 to design your software enable us to do to be much smarter than Life 1.0. High intelligence requires both lots of hardware made of atoms and lot of software made of bits. The fact that most of humans' hardware is added after birth growth is useful since our ultimate size isn't limited by the width of our mom's birth canal. In the same way, the fact that most of our human software is added after birth through learning is useful. Since our ultimate intelligence isn't limited by how much information can be transmitted to us at conception via our DNA. 1.0 style. I weigh about 25 times more than when I was born. And the synoptic connections that link the neurons in my brain can restore about human 100,000 times more information than the DNA that I was born with. Your synapses store all your knowledge and skills as roughly 100 terabytes worth of information, while DNA stores nearly about a gigabyte, barely enough to store a single movie download. So it's physically impossible for an infant to burn speaking perfect English and read it to ask her college entrance exams. There is no way the information could have been preluded into her brain since the main information module she got from her parents, her DNA, lacks sufficient information storage capacity. The ability to design your software enable Life 2.0 to be not only smarter than Life 1.0 but also more flexible. If the environment changes, 1.0 can only adapt by slowly evolving over many generations. Life 2.0, on the other hand, can adapt almost instantly via software update. For example, bacteria frequently encountering antibiotics may evolve during evolve drug resistance over many generations. But individual bacteria won't change its behavior at all. In contrast, a girl learning that she has a peanut allergy will immediately change her behavior to start avoiding peanuts. This flexibility gives life 2.0 an even greater edge at the population level. Even though the information in our human DNA hasn't evolved dramatically over the past 50,000 years, the information collectively stored in our human brains, books and computers have exploded. By installing a software module enabling us to communicate through sophisticated spoken language, we ensure that the most useful information stored in one parent's in persons, one person's brain could get copied to other person's brains, potentially surviving even after the original brain died. By installing a software module enabling us to read and write, we became able to store and share vastly more information than people could memorize. By developing brain software capable of producing technology, by studying science and engineering, we enable much of the world's information to be accessed by many of the world's humans with just a few clicks. This flexibility has enabled Life 2.0 to dominate Earth, freed from its genetic shackles. Humanity, humanity's combined knowledge has kept growing at an accelerating pace as each breakthrough enabled the next. Language, writing, the printing press, modern sciences, computer, the internet, etc. This ever faster cultural evolution of our shared software has emerged as the dominant force shaping our human future rendering our glacially slow biological evolution almost irrelevant. Yet despite the most powerful technologies we have today, all forums of, all life forms we know of remain fundamentally limited by their biological hardware. No one can live for a million years, memorize all of Wikipedia, understand all known science or enjoy space flight without a spacecraft. None can transform our largely lifeless cosmos into a diverse biosphere that will flourish for billions or trillions of years, enabling our universe to finally fulfill its potential and wake up fully. All this requires life to undergo a final upgrade to Life 3.0, which can design not only its software, but also its hardware. In other words, Life 3.0 is the master of its own destiny, finally fully free from its evolutionary shackles. The boundaries between three stages of life are slightly fuzzy. 
if fact if bacteria are life 1.0 and humans are life 2.0 then you might classify mice as 1.1 they can learn many things but not enough to develop language or invent the internet moreover because they lack language what they learn gets largely lost when they die not passed on to the next generation similarly you might argue that today's humans could count as life 2.1 we can perform minor hardware upgrades such as implanting artificial teeth, knees and peacemakers, but nothing as dramatic as getting 10 times taller or acquiring a thousand times larger, bigger brain. In summary, we can divide the development of life into three stages, distinguished by life's ability to design itself. Life 1.0 Biological state evolves its hardware and software. Life 2.0 Zero cultural state evolves its hardware, designs much of its software. Life 3.0 technological state designs its hardware and software. After 13.8 billion years of cosmic evolution, development has accelerated dramatically here on Earth. Life 1.0 arrived about 4 billion years ago. Life 2.0 we humans arrived about 100 millennia ago in many ai researchers think that life 3.0 may arrive during the coming century perhaps even during our lifetime spawned by progress in ai what will happen what will this mean for us that's the topic of this book controversies this question is wonderfully controversial with with the world's leading ai researchers disagreeing passionately not only in their forecasts but also in their emotional reactions, which range from confident optimism to serious concern. They don't even have consensus on short-term questions about AI's economic, legal, and military impact. And their disagreements grow when we expand the time horizon and ask about artificial general intelligence or AGI, especially about AGI reaching human level and beyond, enabling life 3.0. General intelligence can accomplish virtually any goal, including learning in contrast to the, say, the narrow intelligence of a chess-playing program. Interestingly, the controversy about Life 3.0 centers around not one, but two separate questions. When and what? When, if ever, will, will it happen and what will it mean for humanity? The way I see it, it... Uh, the way I see it, there are three distinct schools of thought that all need to be taken seriously because they each include a number of world-leading experts. As illustrated in figure one, in figure 2.1.2, I think of them as digital utopians, techno-skeptics and members of the beneficial AI movement, respectively. Please let me introduce you to some of the most eloquent champions. Digital Utopians. When I was a kid, I imagined that billion billionaires exuded pomposity and arrogance. When I first met Larry Page at Google in 2008, he totally shattered those stereotypes. Casually dressed in jeans and a remarkably ordinary looking shirt. He would have blended right in at the MIT picnic. His thoughtful, soft-spoken style and his friendly smile made me feel relaxed rather than intimidated talking with him. On July 18, 2015, we ran into each other at a party in Napa Valley thrown by Elon Musk and his, and, and his then-wife, Talola, and got into conversation about the scatological interests of our kids. I recommended the profound literary classic The Day My Butt Went Psycho by Andy Griffiths, and Larry ordered it on the spot. I struggle to remind myself that he might go down in history as the most influential human ever to have lived. My guess is that if super intelligent digital life engulfs our universe in my lifetime, it will be because of Larry's decisions. With our wives, Lucy and Mia, we ended up having dinner together and discussing whether machines would necessarily be conscious an issue that he argued was a red herring later that night after cocktails a long and spirited debate ensued between him and elon about the future of ai and what should be done as we entered the we were few hours of the morning the circle of bystanders in kibitzers kept growing larry gave a passionate defense of the position i like to think of as digital utopianism that digital life is the natural and desirable next step in the cosmic evolution and that if we let digital minds 
be free rather than try to stop or enslave them, the outcome is almost certain to be good. I view Larry as the most influential exponent of digital utopianism. He argued that if life is ever going to spread throughout our galaxy and beyond, which he thought it should, then it would need to do so in digital form. His main concerns were that AI paranoia would delay the digital utopia or cause a military to take over of AI that would fall full of Google's don't be evil slogan. Ellen kept pushing back and asking Larry to clarify details of his argument, such as why he was so confident that digital life wouldn't destroy everything we care about. At times, Larry accused Ellen of being specious, treating certain life forms as inferior just because they were silicon-based rather than carbon-based. We'll return to explore these interesting issues and arguments in detail starting in Chapter 4. Although Larry seemed outnumbered that warm sum summer night by the pole, the digital utopianism that he so eloquently championed has many prominent supporters. Robotists and futurist Hans Morovic inspired a whole generation of digital utopians with his classic 1988 book, Mind Children, a tradition continued and refined by inventor Ray Kurzweil, Richard Soden, one of the pioneers of the AI subfield known as the Reinforcement Learning, gave a passionate defense of digital utopianism at our Puerto Rico conference that I'll tell you about shortly. Technoskeptics Another prominent group of thinkers aren't worried about AI either, but for a completely different reason. They think that building human super they think that building superhuman or AGI is so hard that it won't happen for hundreds of years and therefore view it as a silly to worry about it now. I think of this as the technoskeptic position, eloquently articulated by Andre. Fearing a rise of killer robots is like worrying about overpopulation on Mars. Andrew was the chief scientist at Baidu, China's Google, and he recently repeated this argument when I spoke with him at a conference in Boston. He also told me that he felt that worrying about AI risk was a potentially harmful distraction that could slow the progress of AI. Similar sentiments have been articulated by other technoskeptics such as the Rodney Brooks, the former MIT professor behind the Roomba Robotics Vacuum Cleaner and the Baxter Industrial Robot. I find it interesting that although the digital utopians and the technoskeptics agree that we shouldn't worry about AI, they agree on little else. Most of the utopians think human-level AGI might have might happen within the next 20 to 100 years, which the technoskeptics dismiss as uninformed pie-in-the-sky dreaming, often deriding the prophesied singularity as the rapture of the geeks. When I met Rodney Brooks at a birthday party in December 2014, he told me that he was 100% sure it wouldn't happen in my lifetime. Are you sure you don't mean 99%? I asked him in a follow-up email, to which he replied, No, Wimpy, 99%. 100% just isn't going to happen. The Beneficial AI Movement When I first met Stuart Russell in a Paris cafe in June 2014, he struck me as the quite essential British gentleman, eloquent, thoughtful, and soft-spoken, but with an adventurous glint in his eyes. He seemed to me a modern incarnation of Phileas Fogg, my childhood hero from Julius Verne's classic 1873 novel around the world in 80 days. Although he was one of the most famous AI researchers alive, having co-authored the standard textbook on the subject, his modesty and warm soon put me at ease. He explained to me how progress in AI had persuaded him that human-level AGI this century was real possibility and that although he was hopeful, a good outcome wasn't guaranteed. There were crucial questions that we needed to answer first, and they were so hard that we should start researching them now, so that we have had the answers ready by the time we needed them. Today, Stuart's views are rather mainstream, and many groups around the world are pursuing the sort of AI safety research that he advocates. But this wasn't always the case. An article in the Washington Post referred to as 2015 as the year that AI safety research went mainstream. Before that, talk of AI risks was often misunderstood by mainstream AI researchers and dismissed as loaded scaremongering aimed at embodying AI progress. As we'll explore in Chapter 5, concerns similar to Stewart's were first articulated over a half century ago by computer pioneer Alan Turing and mathematician Irving J. Good, 
who worked with the touring crew to crack German codes during World War II. In the past decade, research on such topics was mainly carried out by a handful of independent thinkers who weren't professional air researchers. For example, Elzer Yudkowsky and Michael Vassar and Nick Bostrom, their work had little effect on most mainstream air researchers who tended to be focused on their day-to-day -day tasks of making air systems more intelligent, rather than contemplating the long-term consequence of success. Of the air researchers I knew who did harbor some concern, many hesitated to voice it out of fear of being perceived as alarmist technophobies. I felt that this polarized situation needed to change so that the full AI community could join and influence the conversation about how to build beneficial AI. Fortunately, I wasn't alone. In the spring of 2014, I had founded a non-profit organization called the Future of Life Institute. Together with my wife, Mia, my physicist friend, Anthony Aguirre, Harvard great student, Victoria Krovick, and Skype founder, Jan Talon. Our goal was simple, to help ensure that the future of life existed and would be as awesome as possible. Specifically, we felt that technology was giving life the power either to flourish like never before or go or to self-destruct and we preferred the former. Our first meeting was a brainstorming session at our house on March 15, 2014, with about 30 students, professors and other thinkers from the Boston area. There was broad consensus that although we should pay attention to biotech, nuclear weapons and climate change, our first major goal should be to help make AI safety research mainstream. My MIT physics colleague Frank Wilks, who won a Nobel Prize for helping figure out how, to, how quarks work, suggested we should start by writing an open end to draw attention to the issue and make it harder to ignore. I reached out to Stuart Russell, whom I hadn't yet met, and to my physics colleague Stephen Hawking, both of whom agreed to join me and Frank as co-authors many edits later. Our op-edit was rejected by the New York Times and many other US newspapers, so we posted it on my, on my Huffington Post blog account. To my delight, Rihanna Huffington herself emailed and said, Thrilled to have it. We'll post at 1. In this placement at the top of the front page triggered a wave of media coverage of AI safety that lasted for the rest of the year, with Elon Musk, Bill Gates, and other tech leaders chiming in. Nick Bostrom's book Super Intelligence came out that fall and further fueled the growing public debate. The next goal of our the next goal of our FLI beneficial AI campaign was to bring the world's leading AI researchers to a conference where misunderstandings could be cleared up. Consensus could be forged and constructive plans could be made. We knew that it would be difficult to persuade such an illustrious crowd to come to a conference organized by outsiders that they didn't know, especially given the controversial topics, so we tried as hard as we could. We banned media from attending. We located it in Beach Resort in January in Pure Puerto Rico. We made it free thanks to the generosity of Jan Tellen, and we gave it the most non-alarmist title we could come up with. The future of AI opportunities and challenges, most importantly, we teamed up with Stuart Russell's, thanks to whom we were able to grow the organizing committee to include a group of AI leaders from both academia and industry, including Demis Hassabis from Google's DeepMind, who went on to show that AI can beat humans even at Game of Go. The more I got to know Demis, the more I realized that he had ambition not only to make AI powerful, but also make it beneficial. The result was a remarkable meeting of minds. The AI researchers were joined by top economists, legal scholars, tech leaders, including Elon Musk, and other thinkers, including Werner Vinch, who coined the term singularity, which is the focus of Chapter 4. The outcome surpassed even our most optimistic expectations. Perhaps it was a combination of the sunshine and the wine, or perhaps it was just the time was right. Despite the controversial topic, a remarkable consensus emerged, which we codified in an open letter that ended up getting signed by over 8,000 people, including veritable, uh, veritable who is in who and AI. The gist of the letter was that the goal of AI should be redefined. The goal should be so create not under undirected intelligence, but beneficial intelligence. 
The letter also mentioned a detailed list of research topics that the conference participants agreed would further this detail. The beneficial AI movement has started going mainstream. We will follow its subsequent progress later in the book. Another important lesson from the conference was this. The question raised by the success of AI are in merely intellectually fascinating. They are also morally crucial because our choice can opt to, uh, potentially affect the entire future of life. The moral significance of humanity's past choices were sometimes great but also limited. We have rec recovered even from the greatest plagues. Even the grandest empires eventually grumbled. Past generations knew that as surely as the sun would rise tomorrow, so we could to we we would tomorrow's humans. So we so would tomorrow's humans tackling paranoia, scorches, such as poverty, disease, war. But some of the Puerto Rico speakers argued that this time might be different. For the first time, they said we might build. Technology powerful enough to permanently end those scourges or to end humanity itself. We might create societies that flourish like never before on earth and perhaps beyond or our or a calf casks global surveillance state so powerful that it could never be toppled. Misconceptions. When I left Puerto Rico, I did so convinced that the conversation we had there about the future of AI needs to continue because it's the most important conversation of our time. It's the conversation about the collective future of all of us, so it shouldn't be limited to AI researchers. That's why I wrote this book. I wrote it in the hope that you, my dear reader, will join this conversation. What sort of future do you want? Should we develop lethal autonomous weapons? What would you like to happen with job automation? What career advice would you give today's kids? Do you prefer new jobs replacing the old ones or jobless society where everyone enjoys a life of leisure in machine-produced wealth? Further down the road, would you like us to create Life 3.0 and spread it through our cosmos? Will we control intelligent machines or will they control us? Will intelligent machines replace us, coexist with us or emerge with us? What will it mean to be human in the age of artificial intelligence? What would you like to would you like it to mean and how can we make the future be that way? The goal of this book is to help you join this conversation. As I mentioned, there are fascinating controversies where the world's leading experts disagree. But I've also seen many examples of boring pseudo controversies in which people misunderstand and talk past each other. To help ourselves focus on the interesting controversies and open questions, not on the misunderstandings, let's start by clearing up some of the most common misconceptions. There are many competing definitions in common use for terms such as life, intelligence, and consciousness. And many misconceptions come from people not realizing that they're using a word in two different ways. To make sure that you and I don't fall into this trap, I've put a cheat sheet in Table 1.1 showing how I use key terms in this book. Some of these definitions will only be properly introduced and explained in later chapters. Please note that I am not claiming that my definitions are better than anyone else. I simply want to avoid confusion by being clear on what I mean. You will see that I generally go for, for broad definitions that avoid un anthropocentric bias and can be applied to machines as well as humans. Please read the cheat sheet now and come back and check it later if you find yourself puzzled by how I use one of its one of these words, especially in chapter four to eight. Technology cheat sheet life process that can retain its complexity and replicate life 1.0 life that evolves its hardware and software biological stage life 2.0 life that evolves its hardware and but designs much of its software cultural stage. Life 3.0, life that designs its hardware and software, technological stage. Intelligence, ability to accomplish complex goals, artificial intelligence, non-biological non intelligence, narrow intelligence, ability to accomplish a narrow set of goals, example, play chess or drive a car. General intelligence, ability to accomplish virtually any goal, including learning. Universal intelligence, ability to acquire general intelligence given access to data and resources. Human level artificial intelligence or human level artificial general intelligence or AGI. Ability to accomplish any cognitive task at least as well as humans. Human level A inter artificial intelligence AGI. Strong AI AGI. Super intelligence general intelligence far beyond human level. Civilization. 
interacting group of intelligent life forms, consciousness, subjective experience, qualia, individual instance of subjective experience, ethics, principles that govern how we should behave, teleology, explanation of things in terms of their goals or purposes rather than their causes, goal-oriented behavior, behavior more easily explained by its effect than via its cause, having a goal, exhibiting goal-oriented behavior, having purpose, Serving goals of one's own or of another entity. Friendly AI superintelligence whose goals are aligned with ours. Cyborg, human-machine hybrid. Intelligence explosion, recursive self-improvement rapidly leading to superintelligence. Singularity, intelligence explosion. Universe, the region of the space from which light has had time to reach us during the one during 13.8 billion years since our Big Bang. In addition to confusion over, over terminology, I've also seen many AI conversations get derailed by simple misconceptions. Let's clear up the most common ones.